Hello, everybody. Hope you're all doing well today. Um, welcome to our informational webinar entitled EB1A and National Interest Waiver Green Cards. Um, hopefully this is what you're here to see. Um, for those of you watching live, and we are recording as well, so we can send a link for people watching this later on. So this is obviously I wouldn't be a lawyer if I didn't have a disclaimer at the start of my webinar, but just to let you know, obviously this is an informational webinar. Um, it is not legal advice. I am an attorney and have been for many years, but I am not your attorney. And you know, this is just so don't rely on this as, as specific legal advice to you. Um, any timelines or information that we're giving is, you know, going to be based on the information that we have available today. Um, which can change. So just keep that in mind. Um, this is me, Fiona McEntee. I am an Irish-born US immigration attorney. I am the founder and managing partner of McEntee Law Group in Chicago. Um, I have 15 years of immigration experience and I have published a couple of books and I do a lot of speaking and um, media commentating and, and just like generally talking about immigration um, and advocating at the federal level as well. So speaking to our members of Congress about um, immigration. Um, here are some ways to get in touch with us. This is my info on pretty much all social media platforms. Um, also TikTok, you know, and our email address is there. The firm has its own social media handles, but they're mine. LinkedIn is a great way to connect with me because I share a lot of articles and commentary on LinkedIn. So hopefully you can connect with me there. Um, something to keep in mind about immigration is that the law, the immigration laws are really stuck in a 30 year old time warp. Um, and really what I mean by that is it, Congress hasn't really enacted immigration laws in a very long time. However, that does not mean that immigration is not changing pretty frequently. It is changing and it's changing by different policies that have been created by various administrations. And so even though the underlying law isn't changing, how the law is being applied, which is we see through policy updates, um, that's changing a lot. So, and I'm gonna share some important policy updates in today's webinar that are relevant to the green card options that we're gonna be chatting about today. Um, so follow us online. You can join our email newsletter list. And um, we also do the first Fridays, which is a live update with a McEntee Law Attorney. And um, that's happening, I believe this Friday, which is the first Friday. Um, so you can join that um, for upcoming Fridays. Um, first Friday of the month. Um, I've also written a book on startup um, immigration options. Um, it is entitled US Immigration Options for Startups, but I think it's also applicable to other people and not just to startup founders. Um, some topics that are covered, like, you know, that I think are relevant are what is considered work in the US. Um, you know, things like premium processing and so other concepts that I think are more readily um, applicable to to pretty much everybody who's who's thinking about immigration. So you can check that out on Amazon and we'll share a link afterwards as well. So this is the overview, the, the meat of the presentation today. And these are the things that we're going to discuss in this order. So I'm going to share the main ways that people look to get a green card. Um, I'm going to introduce the concept of self-sponsoring a green card and what does that mean and um, sharing some policy updates. Then we'll get into the EB1A national or um, extraordinary ability green card. Then we'll talk about national interest waiver green cards, how the process works for these in terms of procedures and um, some tips to enhance your approval chances, hopefully um, next steps. And then we'll take some Q&A. So um, there's a lot of people that have signed up to today's webinar and a lot of people online, which is so exciting. I'm so happy that we have such a great audience today. So I would encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A, but just be mindful that this is a public forum. So everybody's going to see your questions. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't ask them, but just be, you know, be conscious of the stuff that you're putting on in the Q&A. And that goes for anything that you're putting online. You know, you just need to use your common sense and be smart about the stuff that, that we're sharing online. And so don't share anything confidential, okay? Um, okay, so before we get into the types of green cards, I just wanted to share the benefits of having a green card. And, you know, this 
certainly hits home for me because I came to the US as an international student. So I was on a student visa and went through, you know, the green card process. And I know how important it is for people to have a green card and I can see what people can do once they get a green card. And, and you know, the benefits that I really see um, are just the sense of security that people get of having a green card. And um, this is really important, especially if your green card is currently tied to an employer. I know there's there have been a lot of anxiety and fear regarding the layoffs and kind of what, what happens if one of those layoffs happened to you and you were here on a visa. Um, so having that sense of security is really important to people and I, I do deeply understand that. Um, also being able to bring, like have your spouse and children join in the process and get a green card as well. Um, and then you have flexibility with employment. You can potentially get citizenship, you know, assuming you meet the requirements down the line. Um, travel is easier. You don't have to schedule visa stamping appointments um, and you can potentially sponsor some family members. Um, and then there's just a whole host of benefits. But this is why this topic is so important because a green card can give people a lot of um, opportunity. And so um, I just wanted to share a little bit about my journey. So that is my law school graduation um, with my grandmother-in-law. And um, that was many years ago. And I started working on in for a, a big high volume immigration law firm and started kind of focusing in on extraordinary ability cases back then and um you know fast forward 15 years later i have been fortunate enough to lead panels on the extraordinary ability green cards and o1 visas like many panels at our immigration lawyers association and i you know kind of keep up to date with trends and feel really delighted to be part of such a great community and be have been able to help so many people, clients and their families along the way. Um, we also have an amazing team of 15 people here at McEntee Law Group and we handle immigration um, exclusively and have a great reputation for some of these cases as well. Um, so when, when we're thinking about green cards, the main ways that you can get a green card are through family, employment, investment, um, hardship type green cards and um, diversity, which is the green card lottery. Um, you know, noting, I noted here that through the family and the employment options, generally those require a petitioner. So an employer or a US citizen, somebody who is needed to start the process. Um, and when we're talking here today about self-petitioned, self-sponsored green cards, we are talking about employment-based green cards that you can sponsor yourself for. So you can act as both the petitioner and the beneficiary. You can file it on your own behalf. Um, so that's what we mean when we say self-sponsored. Um, now, what if you have an employer that wants to support your green card? Can you still do a self-sponsored green card? Um, and the answer is yes. And we can talk about how that will fit into it. But, you know, regardless of the option that you're going to go with it, in this context, whether it's the Extraordinary Ability Green Card or the National Interest Waiver Green Card, you need to show what you're going to do in the US once you get your green card. And if you have an employer that is willing to obviously give you a job offer, um, you know, a, an employment contract, evidence to show that you're going to continue to work in your field, you know, that's going to be beneficial. We can talk about whether it would make sense for the employer to petition for you or if it makes sense for you to self-petition. Um, and here for today's purposes, we're talking about where you're self-petitioning, but you would still use the that evidence of what you're going to do in the future. Um, you don't have to have a job offer. You can be creating your own company. You can you know, show that you're going to be working for yourself. Um, so there's other ways to prove that you're going to, you know, what you're going to do in the US. Um, so in the, in the self-sponsorship employment-based route, to, to be clear, we're talking about the EB1A Extraordinary Ability Green Card and the National Interest Waiver Green Card. I mentioned from the start that there are some significant policy updates that I think are very beneficial for people considering green cards right now based on the administration that we have. And I think it's important, this is a strategy that I recommend to people, is that we can, anywhere where we can use the words of the administration. Recording in progress. Um, where we can use the words of the administration in support of the case, 
you know, that is going to be really important for building up the case. And here's a quote that I include pretty much in all our cases where it's relevant. Um, and even if it's not directly relevant to that particular case, you can find a way to use it, I think. Um, so, you know, the Biden-Harris administration believes that the greatest strength is the ability to attract global talent. So this is their statement. And with the statement, not only is it, it's not just words, there's actual policy that has been really beneficial. And some of the changes are... Um, adding some STEM OPT fields that's relevant for international students and um, updated the policy manual for the O&A. This is in January 2022 and um, updated the policy manual for national interest waiver green cards and expanded the J1 um, academic training. So um, specifically, right, we're here to talk about the EB2 national interest waiver. The the importance for us is that the the policy updated some it gave some fleshed out basically evidence that we can use in relation in support of some of these cases and this is in bold the next thing is that the the administration is saying that the uscis will consider an advanced degree in a related stem field particularly a phd as an especially positive factor when looking at national interest waiver cases um that's really big, right? We have clear policy from the administration, from the USCIS as well, about the importance and how we should weigh up what, you know, these cases when we're looking at like STEM fields and advanced degrees, right? So really, really helpful language from the administration. Um, it also, they also direct adjudicating officers to recognize the importance of these critical and emerging technology fields. And we have a list of these fields. This is like gold for us immigration attorneys and our clients. And um, so a tip would be maybe to take a look at those critical fields and see where your work fits in there. Um, and it's not to say, obviously, you can't pursue one of these cases if you don't fit into one of these critical fields. It just means that if you do, you definitely want to be including these in, um, in support of your case. So I've included a screenshot here of the um, the policy from January 2022. Um, so you can just see as well that it basically um, updated guidance to promote effective and efficient processing of benefits. Um, and, you know, basically saying how just it's, it's specific to the national interest waiver green card there. And so you can see that and you can look at the policy manual as well. Since then, there have been even more policy updates that have been really helpful. And something that we're so excited about is that premium processing has been expanded to national interest waiver green cards. And um, what this means is that the I-140, which is the first part of the case, the petition to prove that you, you deserve a green card in the national interest, um, we can expedite that through a process known as premium processing. Um, EB1As could always be premium processed, the Extraordinary Ability Green Cards, but the National Interest Waiver Green Cards could not be. Previously, these cases were taking 12, 18, 24 months, and as a result, it turned a lot of people off um, process, you know, filing these, and, and we would, would maybe look to the EB1A, which is a higher standard, um, versus the National Interest Waiver, but now we have premium processing. Now, the premium processing timeline is a little bit longer. It's a 45 day time frame for adjudication of the first part and not the 15 day that you see in the EB1A, um, but it's still, I mean, 45 days is much better than 48 months um, or like 24 months, maybe not 48, but like two years. Um, so you do have to pay, of course, because it's a premium service. So you're paying for the adjudication in a prompter manner, but it's great that it's an option for people. Um, also, we saw additional updates to the O1B policy manual and some more STEM fields. So some great policy that's happening. I, you know, if there's any takeaway that you get from the webinar is like, if you're considering one of these, really think about whether this is something that you should do sooner rather than later. Um, you know, and this is not to scare anybody or to, you know, we, you know, it, the reality is we don't know that these policy updates will be around forever. Um, administrations can come and go and changes can happen, you know, sweeping changes can happen in a very prompt manner. And um, so we are advising on the policy that we have right now, with the premium processing and with these updates to the policy manual. So I would seriously be considering this option if I was looking at ways to get a green card. Um, and obviously you need to be able to put forth a case. Not everybody's gonna qualify, 
But if you are somebody that m might have a strong case or, you know, a, a, we could work with you to put together a strong case, I would be looking at these options now. So we're going to first start talking about the EB1A, which is the Extraordinary Ability Green Card. Um, people here may have heard about the O1 visa. Some people may be on an O1 visa. Um, and I thought it might be helpful to just talk about this. I, I mean, this green card is called or all sorts of things, the Einstein visa or the Einstein green card and lots of different things. But it's the Extraordinary Ability Green Card. And it's the EB, the employment based category, and it's in the first preference. And that, that matters because it depends on green card availability. So it's similar to the O1, um, except for the standard is higher for the EB1A. So in O1B arts, for example, we're looking at distinction. In the O1A, we're looking at extraordinary ability, meaning you're at the small percent that has risen to the top of the field. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're trying to prove, this elevated standard. Um, now, a question that we get asked often is, I, if you have an approved O1, does that guarantee you an approved EB1A? And the answer is no, it doesn't guarantee you one. Um, but I think it's a good, I think it's a good um, place to start, right? Um, and this quote I've pulled from the policy manual. My tip again is anywhere where you can use the administration's words in support of the case, you really want to be able to do that. The administration, the USCIS, the agencies, any government words that are supportive to your case, let's see how we can put them into the, um, the case to make it stronger. So this, the policy manual says, though the prior approval of an O1 petition may be a relevant consideration, uh, it's not determinative. Right, so instead of focusing on it not being determinative, I would focus on how it's relevant, right? And we we definitely really frame out these cases as a, a great narrative about extraordinary ability and talking about like the government has already determined they're at least the O1 level of extraordinary ability. Um, and they're also, we're gonna show you now that they're also extraordinary ability as required for the EB1A green card. Um, it is important to note as well that you do not have to be on an O1 first, right? You don't have to, You we have done EB1A green cards for people who were not even in the US, that were outside the US and we've prepared their green card from abroad and got them in that way. We've also been able to successfully get these cases approved for people on H1B visas, um, on E2 visas, um, L, so lots of different types of visas, not just O1s. However, if you're considering, you know, a strategy, sometimes I think it's an idea to what I say, test the extraordinary ability waters first with the O1 to see, can you meet the O1 level of extraordinary ability? And if you can, how soon do you want to springboard up to the EB1A? And that's important too. Timing can be key. You know, you don't want to wait till your career is in a slump and then try to get the green card, you want to go at the peak of your career for the EB1A. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that the it's like the green card version of the O1, or the, sorry, the EB1A, yeah, it's like the green card version of the O1, but in the O1, there's two separate uh, categories. There's the O1A and there's the O1B, and actually O1B is kind of subdivided, but basically O1A and O1B, and they have eight criteria and six. And in the EB1A, there's just one big, category. So instead of having the six or eight, you have a list of 10 criteria. And now some of those, there's there's absolutely really no chance. I think that everyone is going to apply, every possible criterion is going to apply to you. And um, But there's a list of 10 and you look through them and we can talk about what that process is like. Um, and you can self-petition for this, but you do need to show that you're going to continue to work in your area of, in your field. So how do you prove that you're eligible for an EB1A. So the three things we're thinking about is extraordinary ability in your field, and this is the definition, sustained national or international acclaim. Evidence that you're gonna to continue to work in that field. You know, there's no point in proving that you're extraordinary in let's say your industry as a model. If your your plans when you come in are to immediately um, do be a chef or something like a startup entrepreneur that's not related to your previous work. So we want to show that you're going to continue to work in your field. And um, then we need to show that your entry is going to benefit the US. And we'll get into the, the nitty gritty of these. So first thing, 
extraordinary ability in your field. And for me, that I the question that I ask is then, what is your field? And this is a cute little graphic that I like to use. And I have kind of termed this the Goldilocks approach to your field of expertise. Um, so hopefully everybody gets that reference, um, even those who don't have kids, right? But we, we remember the fairy tale about the porridge being like too hot, too cold, just right. And in this context, you do not want to define your field too narrow. Um, you also don't want it to be too broad that you're competing with like everybody. And um, it needs to be just right. So you can work with us. We will work with you to, to really figure out how we're going to define your field of expertise. You know, you don't want to just be a startup entrepreneur. That's extremely broad. And um, you you don't want to be just, a you know, a designer because then who are you, you know, competing against? Everybody who's any type of designer. You want to think about how you're narrowing the field of expertise. And um, this is a quote that I like to share with people. It's from a denied, not our case, but it was a case from 2006. And it basically talks about why you don't want to go too narrow on your field okay so it says ranking at the top of a field of one is meaningless um, and in this case they say you know they agree that it, like it wasn't a field of one right they say while the petitioner's field is not a field of one there are very few people in the field and so essentially you know it's just too small for it to be considered significant when if there's just very few people in your field your field is very narrow being at the top of a very tiny field is not significant enough for the extraordinary ability um, green card. So we're thinking about your field. Then we're looking to see, okay, once we know what your field is, how do I prove that I'm extraordinary in my field? So here is the list of 10 criteria that we're going to be pulling from. Um, you can either, so most people are not Oscar winners, but if you were, um, you would just be able to meet, you don't even need to get into the 10, you prove that you have a one-time award like that. Alternatively, most people, you're looking at this list of 10 and you're trying to see um, if you can check the boxes. And, you know, for purposes of this, you, you want to check three out of the 10 boxes, or if you're checking less than three boxes, um, can you use comparable evidence in support of your case? Um, so before we get into comparable evidence, let's like look through the criteria and see. Um, another thing to note is, you know, you may think you just need to do one thing for a criterion, like check this box, but a lot of them are two parts. So for example, um, if you're proving leading or critical role, you need to prove leading or critical role with distinguished organizations. Um, if it's press, it's published material about you, one part, in major publications, second part. Um, so some of them are some of them are one, you know, maybe high salary could be considered arguably just one, but it's in relation to others in the field. So not really. There is a bit of a benchmark there that you need to do. And um, so you need to be aware of what proving one of these means. Um, you know, asking to judge of, of the work of others, right? And we've we've used this before for people. So you need to prove that you've actually judged others um, individually or on a panel and judging in your field, okay? So we're giving evidence of that. We're showing how you judge them. We're showing, you know, invitations to judge, actual, whether it's hackathons, dance competitions, whatever it is that you're being asked to judge, proving that. Um, so three out of the 10 you want to prove ideally. Um, and a tip that I give to people is look at this list and immediately strike off things that are not relevant to you. So if you're not an artist or you're not doing art artistic exhibitions, get rid of that. If, you, if you're not in the arts, you're not going to be thinking about co um, commercial success in the performing arts. If you're not a scholar, researcher, academic, you know, chances are you will not have authored scholarly articles. So you're just immediately getting rid of ones that just do not apply. And then you're limiting it down. You're kind of left, you're analyzing the ones you're left with and you're trying to see which ones are the strongest ones for you. Um, and so we're, we're ideally checking three of the boxes or comparable evidence. So we have used comparable evidence successfully in EB1A cases before. So this would be where, you know, there's something about your occupation or your field, really your, your position that makes the evidence or, you know, the, the standards just not really applicable to your situation. 
and then you need to prove why they're not applicable to your situation and then you need to show how the evidence you're submitting is comparable to the criteria. And we've done this for people in emerging fields. Let's say you're working in a field that's like really new, like maybe AI. Um, maybe there's no AI awards and, and therefore there's no awards that you could win because there, it's just such a new field that there really aren't any. Um, or, you know, you're, those types of things. So thinking about it creatively, if you need to go to comparable evidence. Um, you know, if not, if you don't need to go there, then you're looking at the criteria and you're checking three of the boxes. Um, but just keep in mind that it is potentially possible to lean on this comparable evidence uh, way to, to prove that you are extraordinary. Um, I thought, again, you'll notice the theme here. I like to pull from the policy manual or from, you know, just government resources where I can. Um, and so this is important to note that like the ca a case cannot be denied because an officer thinks you should be meeting a particular criterion and you're not. So, you know, if they think, oh, you should be able to get proof press, but you didn't submit any press, well, then, you know, they, they you know, they can't deny a case based on that. Their, their, their job is to review the case as presented and judge the, each criterion based on the evidence that you've submitted. Um, so, you know, they can't really make a determination about what they think you should see, they should see in your case. And um, so that's like proving your extraordinary ability. And um, the second thing is you're going to, you need to show that you're going to continue to work in your field. So don't kind of confuse this with, with like a job offer, like a petitioner supporting your case. You know, you can, you can satisfy this in different ways where you can submit a letter from yourself um, kind of outlining your intentions of, you know, what you're going to do. Um, ideally, that's backed up with evidence, whether it's letters of intent to hire from people that you would, um, that would be hiring you for either collabs or as like contractor work, depending on what your field is. Um, if you do have an employer, an employment contract um, with some language that we use that says, you know, this is, this is the anticipated, it's anticipated that the, that, you know, person a is going to continue in this position on receipt of the green card. However, you know, there's some language that says it's at will and things like that, just to show that the intention is that this job is going to continue for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, different itineraries, if that's something that um, is relevant to your field as well. And it is important to strike while the iron is hot. And what that means is, you know, career transitions so going the the one that we think about a lot is the player to coach the dancer to um teacher you know ha, what does that type of career transition look like in terms of extraordinary ability you know are you an extraordinary coach or are you an extraordinary player like have you demonstrated your extraordinary ability in in your teaching coaching field or have you done it in your you know as a performer player so that's it is a hot topic there and there's kind of um you know you can be strategic about this and um you know but you do need to think about capitalizing on your success fame especially for people who maybe are in critical fields that are like this is now is the time that this is like really critical or even like you know other fields that are newer like let's say influencer blogger like if you were at the peak of your popularity you know now might be the time to look at the green card versus waiting you know with who knows the way algorithms and trends and things like that so just something to think about there is uh something to be said for striking while the iron is hot with your career um, and then the third thing we need to show is that your entry is going to benefit the US. This is not defined it's interpreted broadly you know there's arguments that we can make here it's not normally a a massive issue that we see and um, but just know that it is part of the analysis um like a little sip of water and hope everybody is enjoying the content so far um i'm afraid to click on the chat in case i lose my place in the slides but i promise i will get to the questions um in due course so okay national interest waiver this is um you know a real hot topic and i'm so excited to be sharing this um with you today so first thing is you need to prove like it's a two kind of part analysis and each part has kind of sub parts, right? But you're basically proving the first thing is advanced degree or exceptional ability, science, arts or business, and you 
meet the national interest waiver part of the process. Okay, so an advanced degree is either a master's or higher. Remember the policy that, that the advanced degrees in STEM and particularly PhDs are really important here. Um, or a bachelor's degree in at least five years of progressive experience, right? So that's qualifying for the advanced degree part of it. Um, exceptional ability is, is proving these, right? Three of these. So um, you're looking at, some of these are similar enough to the O1 or the EB1A, similar-ish, right? Um, but not as high. So membership and professionals associations doesn't have to be like the extraordinary, um, you know, requirement that, that you're looking at in the EB1A, the O1. Um, recognition of achievements, so expert letters, years of experience, um, high salary, you know, these are kind of a list of things that we can use to prove exceptional ability. Um, and then once we do that, we move on to the national interest part of the thing, part of the case. And we need to prove three things here. Number one, that your proposed work has substantial merit and national importance. Number two, that you personally are well positioned to advance this important work. And then three, on balance, it is in the benefit of the US to waive the normal job requirement and labor certification. Um, if you recall, when we started the case, we spoke about self-sponsoring and not needing a petitioner sponsor. Um, so normally you do need one in the employment-based cases, but here you're asking to waive that requirement because your work is in the national interest, hence the waiver part of the, you know, term. Okay, so um, for for all of these cases, you know, either the EB1A or the national interest waiver, it's a two-part analysis, which we're looking at like the criteria to see whether you meet them by, by preponderance of the evidence. So is it more likely than not? And then it's like the totality of the case. Um, as I mentioned, now is the time to seriously consider national interest waiver green cards um, because we have this great policy that talks about the positive factor of these STEM fields and PhDs in particular and these critical fields. So I'm putting this here again because it is important to be able to talk about these again, right? Because I just think it's it's critical importance. Um, so going back to as well, um, how you're showing that your proposed work has substantial merit, national importance, you're well positioned, and it would be in the interest to waive the requirements. Here, we're focusing on the national or, you know, beyond regional impact of your work. So thinking about things like, you know, people working in healthcare, perhaps like research for cancer or you know, environmental work is something that we're working on as well. People who are, are creating policy, things like that, that are going to be in in the national interest. So beyond your particular region. Um, it's also important for people who are startup entrepreneurs, who are creating jobs, things like that is going to be in the national um, interest. And how do you prove this as well, right? Um, detailed business plan to show the type of work that you're going to be doing. And there are some specific business plan companies that work with um, immigration attorneys and their clients to prepare do a well-documented business plan to show how what work you're going to be doing and how it's in the national interest. And there's also some great like government reports and data about things that are important to the US, cybersecurity, critical, you know, America's competitiveness. Like there's things like that that you can lean on to talk about national interest as well. Um, so I think you know, cast a wide net, be creative, think about how your work is in the national interest. Like if you were creating like curriculum that's going to be used to teach kids across the US, right? If you are um, developing, like I mentioned, like, like healthcare, anything like COVID, we've had people do research for like p pandemics or responses, security responses, um, tech that can be used by clients throughout the US. And um, look at where you're employing people or where you would want to employ people. Um, you know, maybe think of, is there any government government representatives like members of Congress that could provide letters in support of your case? Um, are you affiliated with any ex accelerators, incubators that could support you as well, that could talk about the national impact? Can you get evidence 
from experts in the field to really attest to the critical nature of your work. Um, also, you're going to be looking at your field and looking, is it in is it on the critical technology list? You know, is that something that we could use in support of your case? Um, so really thinking about how your work is going to impact people across the US. Um, then we need to show that you're well positioned to advance your proposed work. And so what have you done to date that is going to help, you know, solidify this in your case? Um, now, an important difference, I think, between the EB1A and the National Interest Waiver is that the EB1A really looks back at your achievements to date. You know, as of the date of filing, have you proven that you're at the top of your field um, and that you're going to continue in that field? So it's future in that sense. But the National Interest Waiver is really like, what's the proposed impact of your work in the future? And how are you the one that's going to be well positioned to, to advance that work? You know, you have the degree in the field. You have been researching this for X many years. You've done, you know, you've developed an app. You did it, you know, how, why are you the one that can, um, you know, really like further this along? Um, so arguably like the standards not as high for the national interest waiver. It's just, it's different because it's not extraordinary ability, like proving that you're at the very top of your field. It's like, does your work have an impact on a national level? And is it, you know, is there substantial merit to it? Um, and then the totality of the, um, you know, just an analysis that basically saying on balance, because of the national importance of the work, because of you, who's going to advance this work, you know, on a, on a, in a critical way, we should waive the labor certification requirements. So the two part analysis I mentioned, we're basically, so in the EB1A and in the National Interest Waiver, we're looking to see, are you checking the boxes? Are you checking the three boxes, three out of 10 boxes in the EB1A? In the National Interest Waiver, are you, do you have an advanced degree or exceptional ability? And are you kind of meeting the National Interest Waiver test? Then on totality, you know, are you meeting, do you have this level of expertise that's required or are you, does your work rise to the level of national importance? Um, again, let's go back to the policy updates and remember how important they are for people, especially those in STEM, PhD recipients, and um, even people who are in the middle of um, a PhD. I think if you've gotten, you know, if we're able to look through that list and show the work that you're doing, um, how that's critical, you know, that could be something to think about as well. Um, so for either of these, really there's there's two main steps involved um the first is the i-140 which is the petition um, and as mentioned you're like self petitioning and um, but there still is a petition and that's the i-140 but that's like the meat of the case it's like proving the extraordinary ability proving the national interest side of the case you know so so that's filed with the uscis with the agency here the department of homeland security and then the second part is the actual green card application um, this is where your family members can come in as well, where they can join on and get their own, um, your spouse and children under 21 can get their own green card as part of your process. Um, we cannot go to, so step step one is the I-140. Um, as I mentioned, you can pre, now premium process both the EB1A and the National Interest Waiver part of these um, green cards. So in the timelines for the EB1A, it's a 15 day time frame for a review. And in the in National Interest Waiver, it's 45 days. Um, and if the case, you know, after the case is filed, it will either get approved or they may issue a request for evidence, which is where the government challenges a certain part of the case and can look for additional evidence in support of it. Um, but let's imagine, you know, either it's approved straight away or approved after a request for evidence. Um, the next thing we generally do is the second step of the process. And the timing for this depends on whether there's a green card available for you in your category, which depends on is it EB1, is it the EB2 National Interest Waiver, and where are you from? Um, unfortunately, people from India and China um, and you know are subject to a great backlog for green cards. Um, how we determine this, how it is determined is there's a visa bulletin, which is the Department of State visa bulletin. We look at that on a monthly basis to assess. 
Um, but you can't get to the second stage of the process unless there's a green card available in your category um, in that month. Sometimes we're able to file both step two and, and step one and two together for certain people. Um, but at the moment, gen there's a backlog, I think, across the board. But right now, we're, what, August, almost September. Um, the government's fiscal year is just about to end. It ends the end of September. So when October comes along, there should be more green cards available. There will be more green cards available in the fiscal year. So we will see some movement of the visa bulletin. But um, it's, it's really impossible to predict. But just kind of be aware that there's a two-step process. Um, and you can either do this from inside the US or from outside the US. And, and doing it outside the US is known as an immigrant visa. So, you know, things that might help you to put forth a strong case would be to really think about the specific criteria that you're going to use. Um, if it's the oh, EB1A, what are your three that you're looking at? And are you really being, a, are you checking the box fully? Um, same with national interest waiver, you know, if you're using like expert letters for either of these, which most likely you will use some type of expert letter, um, it's only as good as the specific content. You know, I have seen a lot of these types of cases and sometimes these letters are that I see that other people, you know, I've just seen letters that I, it wouldn't be the way I'd prepare them. They're a bit, they're very generic and they maybe talk about how someone has great work ethic and is hardworking and of course that's important but it's just not going to seal the deal. You know, if if they're talking about how you played a leading or critical role with distinguished companies, how was your role leading? What specific examples can they prove to show how your role was critical and how are we proving that the company was distinguished? You know, if you've made original contributions, like what are they, how were they original and how do they um, have a lot of significance in the industry? You know, if you judge others, like why were you asked to judge and, and, and examples of like people who judged alongside you, like you want to be able to um, really utilize expert letters in a way to kind of put um, some of the evidence into context. And, um, you know, there's some great case law as well about how we can use expert letters in cases and how, you know, if the expert establishes their credibility. Um, and if they, you know, provide, you know, really clear evidence that is not disputed and there's no contradictory evidence about uh, contradictory evidence, why that should be, um, you know, good evidence for your case. Um, so really thinking about the specific content of those expert letters and who th who's going to write them. Um, you know, who, who would be the best, who would be the best authors of expert letters given your um, background, who knows you, who knows of you, what would they say about your work, things like that. Um, I also mentioned a business plan. This can be really key for people to prove, um, I would say, especially national interest waiver cases, right, to really document, you know, what is the problem, how are you fixing it, and what, you know, what impact are you going to have um, are there reports of, you know, governmental reports of this issue? What kind of, is there media stuff around the issue? And how are you going to advance this? And, and what will the impact be? And how can, can we quantify that? And um, so there are the types of things that you would be thinking about in your case. Um, and, you know, you've heard me say this multiple times today to use the words of the administration or the USCIS in support of the case. Um, how can we and we put this in all our cover letters, in our letters of support, use the administration's words to tell the officer who's adjudicating the case, this is exactly the type of person that the Biden-Harris administration were talking about. This, this person here, we were talking about them. Were they, that's who they were talking about when they made those statements. You know, when they talk about these wanting to attract the best to the US, this is who we're talking about. So I think it's really helpful to use the words of the administration, <clears throat> excuse me, as much as you can. Um, and it's, an, again, policy manual updates, um, statements from the administration, even the mission statement of the USCIS that's been updated using that as well. And um, it talks about a fair adjudication, right? Saying like, don't issue a request for evidence that ignores all the evidence that we've provided. That is not a fair adjudication. You know, your mission, USCIS, is to give our clients, to give people a fair adjudication. Um, and so things like that, I think, um, can be super helpful. Um, and of course, to plan ahead as much as you can. 
you know, the last thing you want to do is to be under a time crunch to get a case filed. Um, I mentioned like the visa bulletin, the time frames um, are uncertain. Um, you know, you do not want to be in a position where you're scrambling to get a case filed. Um, you want to give yourself as much time as possible to really give yourself the best shot of success. And then thinking about maybe if the green card's your ultimate goal, but you can't get a green card right now because it's not available and it's just gonna take time, what are your temporary options that might work for you that would set you up for you know a really strong green card case? Like what can you do right now to uh, work you know ahead to maybe getting one of these green cards um, in the future? So these are some tips, strategies, things that we do here in our firm. Um, as mentioned, there's a team of 15 attorneys or sorry, 15 staff members in total, including other attorneys um, that have a lot of experience in these types of cases. Um, and so if you're here and you're wondering what are the next steps, what can you do? So one thing that we're gonna offer today is we're going to offer a discount off our consultation rates, um, but only for the first 50 people who schedule consultations with us. Um, we just, you know, we have limited hours in the day, but if this is something that you're interested in, we'll be sending some info in a follow-up email, um, or if you're watching this, you know, we'll probably put the links um, there. Um, I would maybe re-watch the recording if this is something that you're really interested in. Um, you can also get my ebook that's available on Amazon that really provides some additional context into this and also some other options that may be applicable for people like startup entrepreneurs. I'll talk about international entrepreneur parole and maybe e-visas, H1Bs, L, so lots of other options as well. Um, and now we're at the, okay, before I go to questions, here's a plug for our social media that you can follow us. This is the firm and I mentioned I'm US visa lawyer on the majority of our platforms. Um, Hopefully this has been enjoyable for people. I'm going to take a look here. Um, I know we have the chat and we also have the Q&A uh, Q &A function. Okay, so if you bear with me, I'll go through this. And just keep in mind that, you know, I am an attorney. I can't be giving people specific advice that they're gonna rely on. I'll try to, um, you know, give some general advice that's gonna be helpful to people. Um, okay, so someone's saying they applied for an extension of their B visa um, and they're currently applying for the EB1A. Um, so that is like strategies for B while you're in the middle of the process of the Extraordinary Ability Green Card. You really would need to talk to the attorney that's handling that case for you. Um, you know, a part of a B is is normally showing that you're gonna return. Um, so you need to think about how to present that in a way that's not inconsistent. You know, we don't, you just need to be careful, I think, about how you frame that. Um, okay, so next question, someone would applying in the green card lottery affect other petitions? Um, I mean, the green card lottery is for people who, you know, diversity visa, so not everybody's eligible to apply. Um, the chances are, you know, not, uh, amazing for people you know the odds aren't great um so it just that's a very broad question about whether it would affect any other petitions you'd need we'd need to see what state did you get selected in the lottery whereabouts you know have you submitted your application did you just apply are you trying to get a student visa and you have a green card pending for a diversity visa so there's a lot of considerations there that would um i'd say be kind of relevant there um, so, okay, asking me to elaborate on the premium process for a national interest waiver. So the premium processing is for the I-140 part of the case, which is like the meat of the case, the petition, the national interest waiver part of the case. Um, and that's really, I think, the biggest hurdle in the green card case is the I-140 petition. And um, that's the part that you can adjudicate. And um, the next part, the final part, is the green card application, which is really going through and showing that there's... Um, there's nothing in your background that would prevent you from getting a green card or being a permanent resident. Like you've no criminal history and you know, no unauthorized um, work or violations. So the biggest hurdle in these cases, again, assuming there's no major inadmissibility issues is the I-140 um, and that's the part that you can premium process. Showing extraordinary ability. Is it harder task for a student on OPT? Um, okay, how we break this apart is OPT is your postgraduate training. Generally, you can do pre or post, but a lot of people do postgraduate OPT. So you can get that for 12 months and an additional 24 months if you have a STEM degree. 
and it's on the STEM list. Um, for extraordinary ability, we do need to show that sustained national or international acclaim. So that kind of means like sustained, like over a period of time. Um, it is possible to go from OPT um, to O1 visa, which we have done, OPT, STEM OPT, O1 visa, and then perhaps on to extraordinary ability visa. Um, and it's not to say that there's nobody, you know, that there's not one person that could go straight from OPT to extraordinary ability visa. Of course, there are, you know, in theory, that could be possible. What did you do before your degree? Is there any other evidence of work? Like, how, are, what are we drawing from to build a case? Um, so it's, it's not, it's not impossible or out of the question. However, I think it's, you know, you do need evidence to build up the case and normally you need to show that you've been working for some time. Um, and with a student visa and with OPT, you know, it, it can be hard because especially if you just have the 12 months of OPT, but if you can also get the additional two years post, um, and, you know, initial OPT, then you may be able to build a case. So um, we've definitely done O ones for people from from OPT. Um, okay, someone saying if you get O one in a tech business in a vertical of one type, but you're fit pivoting to a tech of a vertical in a different, basically, how can you kind of think about um, pivoting in your career? Um, so for 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 O ones and EB one A's, it's not necessarily you know, your field is not necessarily defined by your industry. It's more like, what are you doing? What are your skills? And I'm, you know, is there an overlap there that you can draw? So maybe you're working in one industry, but like pivoting to like a slightly different industry, but, but your skill set is relevant to both. Is there a way that we can tie this together? Like you want to draw a thread between what you've been doing and what you're going to be doing. And so there, you can be strategic about you do about how you do that. Um, so I would say it's not necessarily the industry that matters. It's more like, is there a commonality between your actual work and your daily um, skills? Um, okay, someone's asking, if you're applying for a national interest waiver through advanced degree, do you still need to show extraordinary ability? No. So national interest waiver um, is either the advanced degree or the exceptional ability. Um, and then the extraordinary ability is like a whole separate green card, which is the EB1A. So if you're going for the national interest waiver and you have an advanced degree, so a master's or higher in your field um, or foreign equivalent, you, you can show the advanced degree and then you go into the national interest waiver analysis. Um, otherwise, if you don't have that degree, you can show the um, exceptional ability and the national interest waiver. So hopefully that's um, helpful. So, okay, so for the for the press, if you talk about company and you're a co-founder and co-managing director, or does um, is that enough or does it have to say your name directly? Okay, so the Criterion wants it to be about you. And um, so if we're using press, it would want to be ideally your name would be mentioned um, and your work. Um, if it's not, then maybe press is not your, your strongest of three. Um, you know, we can sometimes get creative with it, but I would start, I would really think, is this your strongest one? Like, is it, it, it you know, or should you look at, at another one? Um, so ideally, the best press is one that's national. Um, so like New York Times or Washington Post and one that names you specifically and your company and talks about your work and not, not something, you know, kind of ancillary like, uh, you know, somebody had come to us where they were interviewed about just like the process of working remotely and yes there's an article about them but it's not actually about their work it's more about something kind of separate right um so I would just say I would look to see it does it make sense for you to, for you to use press right um if you're not named in it directly um okay next question is what are the chances of a foreign lawyer with a master's degree in the U.S. to apply for EB2 national interest waiver I mean I would say it depends like what's your what is the work that you're doing? How is the work national in scope? I, you know, just to tie it back to the work that we do, I, our work is, I think, national. It's immigration, which is federal. Um, you know, we have done some policy advocacy. We have, um, I've submitted a statement to um, Congress, right? I was asked by um, a hearing group in Congress to submit testimony about the importance of startup visas and startup immigration. Um, you know, so something like that where we can prove the national impact. If you, I've done um, presentations to other immigration attorneys, I've uh, teaching them about national interest waiver cases. There's some other immigration attorneys on this today. So 
what are you doing that's helping people beyond your specific region? Is there research? Is there some, you know, if you're if you're creating like case law that's going to help change like policy standards, things like that, um, I think would be important. Um, somebody's asking, uh, can OPT student with major and OK, I'm not that I'm not sure. Uh, oh, can, OK, this is a question. Can OPT with a major in business in supply chain be be phrased accordingly for national interest waiver? So that I mean, it depends on your field. Like, what are you what is you are you specifically going to be doing? I mean, supply chain is obviously a massive national issue. And um, so if you can show that there is there that your work is you know that it's national in scope has substantial importance and that you are well positioned to do this well maybe right it's so that's a good example of something that is a well documented national problem supply chain supply chain issues okay few quite few minutes left so i'm gonna go through it oh while petitioning for eb1a do i recommend targeting only three criteria this is like up for debate amongst attorneys I personally think if you have three solid criteria, go for three solid. I think submitting weaker ones actually make the case appear weaker. And um, so it is my opinion that if you have three strong solid ones to do those, um, sometimes you may find um, it, like based on your experience as an attorney that you actually can't decide between criteria on three and criteria on four. Like you genuinely can't figure out which one is stronger. And if that's the case and they're both as strong as each other, well, then I would probably submit the four of them, right? But if if not, sometimes there's some that are readily more, you know, stronger than others and it can be kind of pretty obvious. Um, Okay, expert letters. Do they need to know you personally or can they be somebody who can evaluate you? I think it's good to have a mixture of both. It's definitely good to have people who know you personally, but it's also really good if someone knows of you by reputation or can like see your work and provide an expert opinion on that. So I think that's actually a really good way to use expert um, evidence. Okay, if your I-140 is improved and your 485 has been submitted. Um, okay, so this is about green card backlogs with your 485. I mean, so you, you would need an analysis of like what you know, if you're here, do you have an underlying non-immigrant visa, like H-1B, are you going to continue to extend that? Maybe you should. Or if your 485 is pending, do you want to switch to just working on that? So that would require specific, um, uh, you know, analysis for you really you need legal advice. Um, so what categories um, can a non-research product? Ma okay, so we're kind of running out of time. Um, but uh, I've gotten through a lot of these people are asking if I recommend premium processing Um, I think look a lot of our cases do premium processing because people want answers as soon as possible Um, you know kind of increase requests for evidence chances it may but it's also you know I, I've heard of requests for evidence without premium processing cases I think you submit you know, really stand by the case that you're filing and know that if you get a request for evidence that you have doc, you've submitted the strongest case from the outset. Um, and sometimes they do ignore the evidence and then you have to go back and refer to the evidence that was submitted. Um, somebody's asking process the 485 from abroad. So you're not actually doing a 485, you're doing the second part as an immigrant visa. And um, but you can do that while you're abroad. And you can potentially think of other options to use while that process is pending as well. Um, somebody's saying if I'm referring to an OPT, if you're doing an executive MBA and you're currently aiming to get the OPT, um, is it conflicting? I mean, you can have multiple things going on at a time potentially where you can get OPT and also be potentially pursuing a green card. So it's just kind of you probably need to talk with somebody specifically about that. Um, Okay, I think I'm at my limit for questions. Um, hopefully you found this helpful. I really enjoyed this. Um, I am delighted that so many people participated here. Um, and we're going to be sending a recording to everybody. Um, I mentioned that we're going to be offering a temporary just like offer for people who are here and a discount off a consultation where we can assess your case and give you some feedback about, you know, which option we think if any of these might work for you. Um, you know, the feedback maybe that they don't work in, in the immediate time, but down the line, they may work for you. So, um, you know, so, some potential uh, ways to chat to us about this. Um, and yeah, it's been kind of a, a jam packed one hour. I hope you found it helpful. It's, you know, we adore working in this field and being able to see what people can accomplish. 
and um, it's just yeah, a real pleasure to be able to help people who are really doing such important work. And um, yeah, this and that is all from me. Um, look forward to seeing you on another webinar on our first Friday that we have coming up this Friday. And um, otherwise, we will see you online on social media. Take care, everybody.